Welcome to Lutheran Church of the Holy Spirit Worship Online, and thank you for continuing to invite us into your home each week. If this service is helpful to you, could you please spread the good news with others by simply clicking the like and or the share button on your YouTube or Facebook feed. If you are in the Denver metro area, please know that you are always welcome to experience Lutheran Church of the Holy Spirit in person. Our Sunday morning services are currently at 8.30 and 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Thank you again for your ongoing support of this ministry as well as so many other nonprofit organizations that continue to do important work in our communities and in the world. Our QR code is online at holyspiritco.org and there is also a form on our website for ongoing donations. Thank you. So much of our faith and the images of God that we have are triggered by rituals. And without getting into a discussion of whether the rituals are good or bad, now I'd like to invite you to, to light a candle in your space as a visible sign of the Holy Spirit's presence in your home, in our midst, and in the world in which we are called to serve. Reconciliation begins with me. Oh, I love to rail against the problems of the world, this pandemic, politicians, my neighbor, who, well, you can fill in the blank. Reconciliation begins with me. As we pray for the world's sins, we begin by acknowledging the roots that live in our own hearts. Let us pray. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. God, forgive. The covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Gracious God, forgive. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste to the earth. Gracious God, forgive. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Gracious God, forgive. Our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Gracious, gracious God, forgive. The lust which dishonors the bodies of women, children, and even men. Gracious God, forgive. The pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not God. Gracious God, forgive. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. <laughs>
compassion, compassionate power transforms sin into help and tempor temporal dust into eternal glory. Grant us a gracious faith so that we may face our trials with confidence and live as a blessing to friend and enemy alike. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will not be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So was it not you who sent me here but God? He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson today comes from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, but I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And for anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, throughout the biblical text, in both the Old and the New Testament, there is this recurring theme of doing justice. In some instances, this action is as simple as loving your neighbor or standing up in opposition to a bully, and at other times, it's as challenging as making amends for a decade of century or centuries old policy. Let's dive into one of the major stories in the Old Testament and consider how its principal character, whose name is Joseph, changes from a man full of himself to someone who gives the gift of life, and in the process has much for us to learn about justice, restorative justice, and what's sometimes referred to as turning the other cheek. 
What we heard just now from Genesis, Joseph's brothers shocked to find him alive and the ruler of Egypt, their return laden with gifts to their father Jacob. Jacob's resolve to see his son again and want the one that he had given up for dead. All this occurs late in this long story of Joseph. Joseph's story resembles a novel more than it does anything else in the Old Testament. This, this story, this novel woven of material from various sources, extending throughout 14 chapters in this first book of Genesis. It's, it's something complex, it's complicated, it's even convoluted. Here is how Nobel laureate Eli Weissel, Jewish scholar and storyteller describes it. He says, it's an incredible, epic, unfocused, panoramic, disdainful of detail and lacking the terseness and sobriety of a work of art. Again, today's reading places us late in this story. The viceroy of Egypt, second only to the pharaoh, he reveals himself to be none other than Joseph. His brothers are dumbstruck. They're maybe even terrified. Years before, you see, they had seen him taken away and placed into slavery. They, they thought that they would never lay eyes on him again, and now he appears before them a ruler with tremendous power, and they come as victims of this famine, desperate to buy food for their family. The Joseph who stands before them is a gift-giving man. He bestows life. On the nation of Egypt, he bestows life through his administrative ability. Despite a long and severe famine, there is, thanks to him, food enough and to spare, safety stored, safely stored away. On his scoundrel brothers, he bestows life through his generous forgiveness. He remembers how they hated him and sought his destruction, but he, he doesn't take or want revenge. On his ancient father, he bestows life by inviting him to a new home. The, the old man, once brokenhearted by his loss, experiences resurrection because his son still lives. Yes, the Joseph who reveals himself to his brothers is a man who gives the gift of life. But it wasn't always so. You see, Joseph began his life as what we might consider a brat. The child of this, his father's old age, he was his father Jacob's pet and reminded the old man of his deceased wife, Rachel. You can be sure that the other sons were wounded and jealous of this favoritism. Worse yet, Joseph was a bit of a tattletale. He, he would tell Jacob, his father, all the bad things that the other boys were saying and recounting them in this full, complete detail. Joseph was very effective at making himself despised. And then there were those dreams. Joseph was a dreamer. He saw in one of his dreams his whole family bowing down to him in awe. He made the mistake of telling these dreams to his already exasperated brothers. Finally, his brothers had had enough. To avoid outright murder, they throw the obnoxious brat into this empty pit, or maybe it was a well. They take his fancy coat that his father had given him. It's the only coat that existed, you see. They messed it up with some animal blood. They tell Jacob, their father, that wild beasts tore apart his favorite son. And their father almost dies from sorrow. Joseph, meanwhile, is pulled out of that well by traveling merchants, and they sell him into slavery. He's strong and sturdy. They see this. He's fit for labor on Egyptian building projects. This itself is a sentence of death in his time. Such slaves, they do not survive for very long. Indeed, they come to yearn for death, most likely. 
Well, that's what happens to Joseph on the outside. Can you imagine what happens to Joseph on the inside? There in that empty well, abandoned forever by his brothers, there in chains of slavery being led to a distant land, the old Joseph, obnoxious and full of himself, he dies a painful death. And in his place appears a different Joseph, who on the exhausting trip to Egypt realized that maybe he's been a fool. And once he arrives in Egypt, something crazy happens. Joseph, he doesn't end up as a quarry slave. He's sold to an army officer, and he begins this far better life of a household servant. He fulfills his duties so well that in time, his master gives him responsibility for the entire household. But his troubles are far from over at this point. His master's wife keeps trying to seduce him, and he keeps rejecting her advances. A lesser man probably may have given in, but Joseph, he feels an obligation to the master who has shown him such favor. He's been entrusted with great responsibility and refuses to betray that trust. No longer is, the, is he obnoxious and full of himself. Now it seems there's room in his life for other people. Feeling frustrated and rejected, his master's wife insists that Joseph had tried to rape her. This false charge, it sticks. The slave has no recourse, and Joseph finds himself in a prison cell. And when his brothers had thrown him into that empty pit, Joseph was indeed an arrogant person. But now Joseph is blameless of this, his experience in that empty pit and his journey into slavery burnt away his arrogance. His time in prison continues to work on him in even deeper, more bold change. Through his utterly unjustified suffering, Joseph realizes that he has a companion. As we read in Genesis, the Lord was with Joseph and showered him steadfast love. Joseph in prison remains a man of dreams. And through these dreams, God speaks to his servant, Joseph. This familiarity with dreams, Joseph's wisdom in understanding these dreams, it results in this remarkable chain of events that bring this lowly prisoner to the attention of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. For the Pharaoh has dreams to be interpreted. Joseph recognizes the, these dreams concern not the, not the Pharaoh alone, but these dreams concern the entire country. Joseph knows that these dreams warn of a long and severe famine. Not only does he interpret these dreams, but he proposes a plan of action to rescue the whole nation. Impressed by Joseph's wisdom, the Pharaoh appoints him to a high government post where he implements his plan to counter the famine. And it is as an important official that Joseph meets his hungry brothers who come to Egypt seeking food. Of course, they don't recognize him at first. That comes as no surprise. No longer is he an arrogant, inflated young man. He seems to now be a humble prince, a life, a gift-giving man, one who bestows life. That Joseph is a person of great ability is not the point at all. The point is that he suffers sometimes for a reason and sometimes for no reason at all, just as you and just as I suffer. And, and Joseph, he, he doesn't allow his suffering to crush him. He gains something valuable from this experience. Like each and every one of us, Joseph doesn't always have a choice as to whether or not he suffers, but like us, he has a choice as to whether his suffering destroys him or transforms him. According to Eli Weisel, in his tradition, there are many stories of 
of Joseph that add to what we find in the Bible. One of them takes place when he and his brothers return home from their father's funeral. On the way back, Joseph makes a detour and stops at that empty well, that empty pit, which once had held him captive. For a long time, he stands at the well's edge and he looks down into the darkness. His brothers, they assume that he does this to remind them of how they once had mistreated him. But that's not the reason at all. This story says that he stares into the well, that place where his transformation began, so that he might remember his past and express gratitude to God. Joseph is thankful for everything that has happened since that long ago time. He seems also to be about the constant practice of doing justice. And occasionally, he seems to also live out the call to something that we might call restorative justice. As followers of Jesus, we are called to seek the truth and to live the truth, which in action demands justice, which leads to peace. And in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., true peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. May the one who is ever at work of bringing about our transformation Teach us the action of doing justice. Thanks be to God.
Encourage your church to follow the leading of your love, especially when it is risky or difficult. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Nurture fields that lie dormant, resting until it's time to bloom again. Bless farmers and all who cultivate fields and urban gardens. Give favorable weather for planting. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Look upon our world with mercy, that we delight in an abundance of peace. Protect all whose lives are marred by war and civil unrest. Release political prisoners and amplify the voices that challenge us to seek forgiveness and pursue nonviolence. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your people cry out for mercy, God. Console hearts that long for forgiveness. Mend broken relationships. Heal bodies that suffer chronic pain or illness. Strengthen and deliver all whose spirit is troubled. Today we pray for Mark, Don, Kelly, Nettie, and all we now name with our lips or in our hearts. such great hope in your promises, O oh God. We lift all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now receive this blessing. May God, who created you for love and who rejoices over you and calls you by name, may this God bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.